Hey guys, welcome to Taste of Recovery, the podcast. Where we explore one's honest journey of surrender, willingness, acceptance, and courage. I'm Alicia Spenlove. And I'm Eden Sassoon. Please join us every week for authentic and raw conversations with inspiring people in recovery. We invite you and our guests to get real because the disease of addiction does not discriminate. Oh no, it doesn't. And we go through so many emotions. We laugh, we cry, we pray. So get ready for a taste of recovery. God gives the strongest battles to his strongest warriors. We're so lucky to have Fausto in the studio with us today. A.K.A. the Hope Dealer. Enjoy his taste of recovery. The Hope Dealer. Yeah. Please explain. So the Hope Dealer <clears throat> is a character that's I play, but it's really me. And uh, people would always tell me, man, you're so hopeful. You spread hope. You're the poster boy for hope. You ooze out hope. And so I was hearing that a lot. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to brand myself as the hope dealer, embody that, and uh, just just be that person uh, because uh, it's been told to me over and over again. And that's how I, that's how the name kind of stuck with me because um, I'm all about spreading hope because I believe hope comes before the miracle, you know, just like pride comes before the fall. And mm-hmm. I believe that it takes somebody to be vulnerable, like insanely vulnerable, to really change lives. Because it's that vulnerability that creates relatability, and that relatability creates connectability, and connection is the opposite of mental health, addiction, and trauma. Mm-hmm. And you see, and that's how healing takes place, being able to do that. But it takes a very open-minded individual and a person who has <clears throat> the ability to, to be okay with what people are going to say about that person because mm-hmm. of what they just said. Mm-hmm. I can't believe they said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What so, did you say about vulnerability? It creates relatability, and relatability leads to connectability, and then connection is the opposite of addiction, trauma, and mental health. I mean, think about it. They said um, drug addicts and alcoholics are spiritual seekers. We always knew there was something more. And so alcohol and drugs releases the same chemicals as God. They did a study, science, scientists did. So they looked at the brain when people pray and praise God, and the way they're brain lit up is when someone takes drugs and alcohol. So we've always been spiritual seekers. And so we've always been looking for connection, but alcohol and drugs gives us God quickly, but it hurts us. And so we chase it. And that's why I believe God is the center of recovery because it's what we've always wanted. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. That is beautiful. That is exactly what we are here for. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. You pray, don't you? Do you? All, all the time. Can you do a prayer? Yeah. <clears throat> Father God, I just want to pray for that in this moment that you could come into our minds, our heart, and our soul, and you can disrupt what the enemy tells us, and you can dispute all the lies, and then you can inspire us with your word, and that you can get us to this place to understand that all the the baggage that we we can't forgive ourselves for, that we have shame for, for the mistakes, for the people we feel like we let down, and just the things that we beat ourselves up about, can you let us know that you don't even remember those things because you forgave us, and when you forgive it, you forget it. And you still bless us because we're your child and you love us. And at the end of the day, you know what your plan is and we don't. And you're helping us just go through this life and your purpose. And so all the trauma, the mental health, the damage, the heartbreak, all that is for your purpose because you know exactly how to use us. And just because we might not have the money or know the right people or have the confidence or the talent, that doesn't matter because in your world, just like Gideon, God, you had 300 people destroy 135,000. And Gideon was full of fear. He was full of um, doubts and all these insecurities, just like all of us in the room, but you used him because he trusted you. So please help us understand your love and your grace and your forgiveness so we can forgive ourselves, we can love ourselves, and we can see how you see us and we can trust that you're with us even when we don't feel it because you love us. And so thank you for loving us where we're at and helping us where we're at. Amen. 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 You said when you forgive it, you forget it. God forgets. He's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You're the only person beating yourself up. And yet we continue <clears throat> to do that. Yeah. yeah. Over and over again. Yeah. 
But how did you get to this place um, in life? You know, my whole life I've always felt super uncomfortable in my skin, but I also always felt like there was something more. Whether it was, oh, I wonder if I can have superpowers one day if I pray enough. I wonder if I get strong enough, I'll be the strongest person in the world. I can be the smartest person, you know, the best skateboarder, whatever. I've always been that kid. But internally, I've always been very insecure, anxious, afraid. And um, back then, I didn't know how to label it. I just thought, I'm like, something is wrong with me. And I would examine everybody in elementary school, like, if I dress like him, act like him, then maybe I can be like him because he seems like he's the cool kid. And at home, my dad's a narcissist, so <clears throat> it's walking on eggshells at home, so it's not safe. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was loving, but, you know, it's not the love that I need. I want my dad's love or, not, you know, I want that. So I would gravitate towards males. And that's why when I would gravitate towards males, um, I just wanted to fit in. And so to be validated, to feel accepted, to feel seen, that was my drug because mm. it gave me peace for that day or that moment. And um, that's why it led to a lot of pain in my life because that led to getting sexually abused at seven by a boy. Mm. It led to um, lying, being dishonest. It led me to drugs and alcohol to fit in. It led me to getting molested at 14 for six months. It led me to seeking love in all the wrong places. See, I've been cheated on 20 times, not because I've been with 20 different women, but because I can't leave no matter how toxic it is because I can't do better. And I have a fear of being alone, so I'd rather get cheated on than be alone. And so every relationship <clears throat> was me getting hurt, but the dialogue in my head was these women cheat on me or leave me because I was molested by a guy. And they see that thing that I see in myself, that mm. I'm not manly enough. Mm. And so I can't say nothing because me getting molested was my fault, right? In my head, it says that. Even though it wasn't, but in my head, it's my fault. There was physical arousal connected to it, which means I liked it. That, and that's not what happens in movies. Mm -hmm. But as I got an adult, I learned that's a biological response. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's right. You know, how many times have you done something that you thought was right and it wasn't? And so, but as... When younger, it was my fault. So shame, fear, guilt, disgust. Mm. Um, every girl leaves me because of that. And I was trying to escape that reality. Um, I became a bodybuilder, a DJ, a bartender, magician, a videographer, a drummer, a hip hop dancer, a server. I tried all these personas thinking like, this is the thing. And it never worked. And then I got tattoos on my body. And that didn't work either. Oh, uh, make it a cool job. It doesn't work. Uh, taking steroids, it didn't work. And so I was always like running away from this thing that I forgot existed because I remember it till I found alcohol and then alcohol made me forget it even existed. So I'm chasing this life. And then, you know, I think when my mom gets cancer, uh, I grew up in poverty, the heartbreak, the pain, the anger at my past is all this buildup <clears throat> that I tried killing myself because I felt like, I just felt like it was so hard to live and I didn't want to live, but I didn't want to die. And I was in limbo, you know, and it didn't matter how many people said I was amazing or how many friends I had or anything. It didn't matter. I just, I just, I could not figure out life. And it's very uncomfortable. And every year got harder and harder to, to exist in because now I got responsibilities. <clears throat> and the damage that the, the trauma of being molested and all that, I talk very, like, very uh, transparent with this and messed me up. I questioned my sexuality. Um, the thought of me being taken advantage of would turn me on. And I'm like, what is this? This is disgusting. Um, always thinking it was my fault too. Like I let that happen or, you know, I can't believe that. And um, it was just so confusing. Uh, and then you understand what people are capable of. You know what I mean? Once you know that, it's like, hey, this stuff is real. And so it was just lots of, lots of pain, which is why in 2017, I just couldn't take it no more. I couldn't. I got cheated on again. I was like, see, every woman cheats on me because of what happened to me. My mom has cancer. My dad's not in the picture. Um, and I'm getting high every day. And I'm having three to five grand mal seizures a day. Cocaine, doing a half ounce a day, drinking. And I'm just, not, I can't stop. 
my mom's cancer. I can't stop. And so it was just this place of it's over. But I was happy because I said, once I understood that I'm going to take my life, it's a high. It's like euphoric. I don't got to stress no more. I don't got to worry no more. It's done. <clears throat> and so it's a scary place to be when you're in that. And every moment feels like the last conversation, the last text, the last sunset you'll see. But for the first time, I felt peace from it. So when, when people take their life, people say they're so selfish. They're not selfish. In that moment, that's the only choice. And then people question, well, why would you do things like that? Because of the things I went through. You know, people don't really understand that if they haven't been through it, how it affects you. And so it's, it's really difficult to live in this place where you're never good enough and you're only as good as your last thing you did. It's, I hate, I hate that. So I hit my rock bottom and for whatever reason, God kept me alive and I finally broke down in desperation and I had a, a magician friend that I would come to my restaurant and he was the only person I knew at this time that was like locked up, came out and now found God. So that was a miracle in my life. Because remember, I don't know anything about AA at this point. I've just seen it in a TV show. I don't even know what rehab is. I've just seen celebrity rehab. Like, and so I'm like, I don't know. And so wow. I reach out to my buddy. I need some help. Picks me up, takes me to his house. I tell him everything I told you for the first time to somebody. And he read me some scripture. And it wasn't what the scripture said specifically. It's what I interpreted, interpreted from it was that God gives his strongest battles to his strongest warriors. The first time in 25 years, my migraine headache went away. I felt relief. I felt like I just smoked meth and I didn't smoke meth. You know what I mean? I was like, this feeling that I felt was peace and relief, and I haven't felt this. I wish I would have knew what, where this was when I was a kid. And then I said, well, whatever this is, I want this. And so I remember AA from a TV show, Rescue Me. And I was like, oh, there's this thing called AA. Like, I guess I go to AA, right? Like, let's do it. So I go on my phone, find one in Fullerton, Orange County, California. And I go the next day, 1130, podium meeting. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that there wasn't, the podium meetings were all the meetings. I just went in and, you know, I got anxiety. So I walk in, I sit in the back. I'm like, okay, don't get up to use the bathroom because everyone's going to stare at you. Okay, just sit here. And then they go, they're newcomers. So I look around and I'm like, oh, is that me? And they go, like, oh, yeah, me. They go, do you want to share? Normally I'd have been like, hell no. But I was like, yes. So I go up. I stand on the podium. I share everything I share with you guys for the first time in front of a bunch of people. And this gentleman came up to me and he said, me too. Now, the reason why me too was powerful because until that moment, I was the only person I thought went through that. Two, when God said, I give my strongest battles to my strongest warriors, which means that all the pain that you go through is to help out other people grow through Fausto because you're strong enough to get molested. You're strong enough to be abandoned and neglected. You're strong enough to not have a father in your life. You're strong enough to sit with your mom's cancer. You're strong enough to, to suffer from anxiety and depression and this addiction and this hopelessness and suicidal ideations and all this pain of being cheated on and hurt and betrayed because you're going to be a voice. That moment when somebody said, me too, and I felt connected, I knew that God was real because I was finally myself for the first time and it helped somebody. And so that moment, I didn't know about anonymous. I didn't know that. I didn't. So I put everything out on social media that day, what I just told you. And it just literally began my journey of my recovery, of recovering out loud before recovering out loud was a thing. And so that's how... That was the story of how it got started. And how long ago was that? Uh, over six years ago. October 22nd, 2017. Yeah. And what does the... Um, I'm always crying. <laughs> no, this is good. Hey, feeling is healing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Um, what are these six years? Like, What does one day at a time mean? What does it look like to you? <clears throat> so it's always changed. My first year, I remember my sponsor was like, I was worried about you. So I'm, I'm a weird, goofy, energetic person. So imagine somebody coming into AA has no idea that it's anonymous. And I went recover out loud since day one. And I have no idea, right? And I'm 
just like I just love people. I'm obsessed with people. People are my drug. I think you've met your twin. Over here. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> I love you. Yes. Yeah. And um, it was wild because I walk in and I go on Instagram. I go on TikTok. It wasn't TikTok. Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, doing all these videos, posting, making my own things and all this stuff. People from Japan, India, like the East Coast. Everyone's. Oh my gosh, me too. Like, thank you for sharing that. So I was on fire. And God was my best friend. Like, he was visible at this point. Like, I would pray and he would answer that day. So you can imagine, I was on fire, right? First time following God, first time in recovery, and don't know it's anonymous. And I love people to death. <laughs> and I'm an extrovert. And I'm like, everyone always says, I'm like the person who shits rainbows. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, it's like everything's. So I go full in and addicted mode on helping others. Mm. So mm. my first year was just about being loud. Mm meeting every week, sharing, finding somebody to help. Um, went vegetarian, threw away my TV, started meditating every day, doing ice bath therapy. Um, I started, um, um, what else was I doing? I was running every day. I read a book a day. I was becoming upset. I've never read a book at this point. So I was like, dude, this is incredible. I read a book and I'm a different person. And everything was so um, fascinating, right? Like all these sayings were fascinating. You know what I mean? I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And all the motivation from the online world was really pushing me to keep on going and going. Mm. And um, at that point, I started jumping rope, and I became one of the best jump ropers in the world. There's stories done on me. <laughs> jump rope beat addiction. So that first year, I'm like, I'm on YouTube videos. I'm getting interviewed. I'm meeting all these famous jump ropers. i um, speaking. <laughs> um, I, did oh a, I, I did a solo trip to Oregon for seven days. And like everybody was in recovery when I was there. It was weird. Like the meditation teacher, the person working at the restaurants, mm. the person that owned the hotel. It was weird. Mm. I'm like, dude, God, you're crazy. So I'm like, nothing can stop me. And so I'm doing all this stuff, making videos, doing all this stuff, I'm getting interviewed, getting on podcasts and magazines. And in my one year celebration, <laughs> this is so bad, I brought a party bus. I brought video, I brought videographers and photographers. Yeah. I go into the AA meeting. They're filming everything, right? You shouldn't do that. The party bus drops. I walk in like this. Everybody's in there. I'm like, yeah. And then I speak and I'm like, you know what, guys? I'm about to change AA now. We're going to change the prayers. We're going to change the way this is done. Like... This is the new way. <laughs> and it's funny because my sponsor was like, yeah, I thought you were going to relapse after that. <laughs> He's like, you're so spiritually prideful. Um, but that's wow. just, that's what works for me. God put me on a pink yeah. cloud for the first year. Mm. He just knew that's what I needed. Mm. You know what I mean? I couldn't, I, I couldn't handle any more uh, bad things happening. Mm. I, needed, I needed to feel like this is the rest of my life. So the first year was like that. It was incredible. Mm. It was the second year where... I got emotional. Now I'm depressed. Yeah, right? But question, <laughs> yeah. through this first year, did you do, you had a sponsor, so yep. you got one immediately. Oh, yeah. And you did the steps. Of course, but you know. And there was no emotion involved? No, you want to know why? Why? I got daddy issues. I got a sponsor who's a guy, and you're listening to me? Is this my new dad? Oh. I people please through the steps. Oh, but it was the oh. best thing I've people pleased through my life because it changed my <laughs> life. Wow, interesting. So that's why people used to think I had like 10 years my first year because they're like, dude, you're just like insane. Like all this stuff you're saying is profound and you're doing this and you're going there and you're doing that and the way you speak. But it was just this pink cloud of a like, whole year for me. Mm. And it was funny because like I, it was like I've always, I feel like I was built for AA. I love people. I love helping people. I was like, I'll get to help people? Sick. I get to speak and be the center of attention? Awesome. Like, this is cool. I don't know how to hang out. I know how to help out. Oh. So it was perfect Oof. for me. It was That's like, powerful. yeah, to me, picking up five people from a meeting, driving around, taking them out to eat, and then taking them to the gym, and then driving them all home. To me, like, that. Yeah, that's, that's fun. I don't have to try. That's fun. Like, dude, I'll have you all sleep at my house too. <laughs> Can we watch movies and eat yeah, popcorn? Yeah, yeah. So, so the first year was very easy for me in that way. Mm. It, it, don't get me wrong. It was difficult because now I, ha I don't have any friends because all my friends have partied. Uh, my mom did get cancer the, uh, in my first year, which was, which was challenging. And um, the question of like, well, I've been a bartender my whole life. Like, what do I do? Mm. So there was obviously challenges. Mm. But man, it was such a blessing of a year. It's so incredible. It, the second year was the was the depression year, as they call it, terrible twos. So that's when I got depressed. I got suicidal, and I was like, "No, what's happening?" Mm. And my sponsor goes, "Welcome to recovery. Mm. <laughs> it's not always going to be, you know what I mean, rainbows and unicorns for you." And so I got to get humbled. 
that second year. So the one day at a time became more real at mm-hmm. this point. Right? It's like, oh, okay, I really do got to get one day at a time because I overthink, I future trip, I put expectations, um, and I want to save the world. Mm-hmm. So one day at a time now in these six years is literally a must for me because if I don't, I will trip. I will overcompensate. I will overhelp. I will um, self-destruct things, not my recovery, but anything that I'm trying out of fear and worry. And then I don't feel good enough and I compare and I get envious. And then it's just a bad place to be. So I have to take it one day at a time because I've almost died in my recovery from that. Stress-induced seizure left me half brain dead for a oh. month. The day after, my cousin died from a seizure. Literally, the day the, the day she died, we pulled off the plug. I left, drove off, had a grandma seizure, and became half brain dead. A month after that, my aunt died of a seizure, brain aneurysm. It's a weird year, and it was all from overhelping too many people. So you were so stressed out. That you had a seizure. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and it wasn't like bad stress because to me, um, so I told you guys I'm around about a thousand people a week. So you can imagine my job is helping people, my brand is helping people, my own recovery is helping people, my hobbies are helping people, my ministry is helping people, my social media is helping people. So everything was good stuff. So it was exciting, but then. When life happens, like my cousin dying, it was like this curveball, what you don't expect. And it's emotional because none of the dads or none of the father figures are in my family picture. None of the men are really there. So I come into this place and then program kicks in my head. Fossa, don't make it about you. Ask them what they need, that your mom lost her knees, your cousin lost her sister. Everyone's crying. Her kids are right there. Just, hey, what do you guys need? Just be there. You don't got to fix anything. So I'm in that mode but my whole life is about stuff like that, you know? So when are you there for yourself? Well, now I, I, I'm, a, I'm a lot better. <laughs> I got boundaries. <laughs> you, oh. They're still hard. No is a complete sentence to you too? It's not all the time. Right. I still got to explain. <laughs> I still got to explain why because I'm, you know, I'm overthinking it. Right. But boundaries are a part of my life, but they're still, it's still new. Because even though I almost died, that's still not enough to stop me. It's, it's the truth. I care too much what people think about me sometimes. Mm. You know what I mean? It's just Especially if I respect you. Or my brand became my prison. My brand is the hope dealer. Well, what happens when Fausto is feeling hopeless and in front of a big crowd of people and he can't play that character? Hey, Fausto, we heard. Are you high? Are you this? Are you that? Hey, people are talking. Hey, we can't work with you no more because we heard this rumor, heard this and that. You know what I mean? It was like this prison. It's like I had to be Jesus now right? just to keep my brand afloat. Now, maybe it was all in my head, but I've seen things happen in this where like crazy stuff. And I was like, they said that? Wow, that's what people are saying? Was that why this didn't work out? So I've seen the, I've seen the ripple effects of things like that. But to me, I feel, I feel your vulnerability. And I've, at what point did that become your strength? At what point was that enough? You could be you know, exactly where you're at and people respect that. And there lies the hope. Mm-hmm. It's... It's one of those things I learned the hard way. You go in the spotlight, this is going to happen, unfortunately. This is why a lot of people tell me, this is why I don't share this stuff. Because somebody made a reel of what I said, and then they clipped it, and it went viral. Mm-hmm. And now everybody thinks I said this. So I've had these warnings. But you know me, I'm like, ah, I don't want to, like, ah, I don't, whatever, I don't care. But then certain things I saw come up like, oh, I do care now about this when it was real, like how it affected me. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah there's, yeah, there's a lot of things that come mm-hmm. <laughs> with wow. it. And it's, it sucks, but that's just how it is. And you can't give a fuck about what everyone thinks. Mm-mm. Well, that's why there's a big thing that's happening, so I cannot give a fuck. Oh, shit. Uh-huh. So you asked me earlier, what do I do exactly, right? You are saying that thing to you, like, what do yeah. you do? Yeah. Uh, so I'm a clinical counselor. I am a, uh, I got my master's in theology, I do spiritual advising. I am a- uh, I love it. Group facilitator. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> Sleepover, right? Is that, yeah, that <laughs> Is that what we're doing after the podcast, right? As part yeah. of it? Yes, yes. Um, I am a event planner. 
I am a, uh, you could say, um, building relationships is what I do for a lot for people, help people build their brands and stuff like that. Um, and other than that, what else do I do? That's a lot. Yeah, oh, motivational speaker, mm-hmm. jump roper. I mean, there's a lot of things that I do. But the, the way I encompass everything that I do is I love to help people understand why they do what they do, to see their eyes light up so now we can break the pattern. And the thing about me is I care so much, I want to follow up. Oof. And that's how I live my life. Just like we, I say things to you, like, oh my gosh, this, that. What was your dad? You're probably dating your dad. Oh my gosh, he was a nerd. I love those moments because it's like, hey, guess what? You'll never unhear what just happened. And now when you walk into it, you have more strength to walk away, to stay away, and to do better. And so everything I do is wrapped around that. Yeah. I just want to say I love you. Oh, thank I you. do. Yeah. Thank you. That's painful. And I'm relating to a lot that you're yeah. saying, and you're helping me. I'm going to go home tonight and just take it all in. So thank you. Thank you. So also what I'm hearing is the need to be seen mm-hmm. growing up, yeah. mm-hmm. but not feeling good enough. Mm-hmm. And this addiction to being liked. Yes. On point. <laughs> That's good. And just really feeling just so empty and alone. But on the outside, you probably seem like you have a lot of friends. Yeah. My, and you are spot on, right? What motivated me to do so much in recovery? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been on front of magazines, different countries, speaking, starting stuff, movements, working with celebrities, working with the homeless people, speaking. I mean, everybody knows me in the recovery community for the most part. Uh, amazing things, like ama- amazing things. I mean, you saw that party I showed you, a thousand people. Showed, I gave out $40,000 in gifts. That was given to me because I helped people and they wanted to do me a favor. The performers cost 20 grand. They're famous performers. They did it for free because what I've done for them. All the volunteers for what I've done for them. The venue for what I've done for them. All the people came for what I've done. So that was an $80,000 party that was free because of kindness. And I know I'm not normal and recover. I know I'm not. No, I, I understand that. Um, but a lot of the motivation was that to be seen, you know, and, and, and that's why it drove me crazy because it's like the it's, it's driven by fear. It's all good stuff, but it's like it's not a way to live because it's never enough. But the real you is really sharing all this deep information, this deep personal mm-hmm. experiences that is helping so many people. Yeah. I mean, that's beautiful. But yeah, I relate to that, like needing to be seen. Mm -hmm. I grew up um, feeling like not enough in my household. Um, I couldn't trust anyone. And then I went out into the world and I was... Homecoming queen. Spotlight. It's all about you, center of attention. You did it. Center of attention. To get those things made me feel really validated. Um, But I also am a very sweet person, and I do love people. Mm. And I, I, I love being open, and I love being honest. But I also needed that label that validation in my life. Mm. I needed it or I felt like nothing. Yeah. I either, you know, so now I feel like in recovery, I'm coming to a place where it's, you know, not too high, not too low, just trying to stay right in the middle. Neutral. Neutral. Or a reminder of that or equanimity, you know, that feeling of, of just balanced. We talked about that before. Yeah, they say neutrality is spirituality. Mm. You would mm. think spirituality is like, oh, because when I'm high on life, mm. it's like, no, because you can make bad decisions when you're high on life mm-hmm. to be at that, just like you said, neutral, mm. not high, not low, but here we're protected. Mm. You know, you're just like, I'm good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it takes a lifetime to like 
figure that out because you're chasing, you're just chasing a feeling, you're chasing a high, you're mm-hmm. chasing the next moment. And yet, like, the simplicity of this is what it's about. Yeah. I think the, and this is just my theory, I think there can be a backfire of recovering out loud. You know, because again, if we have the validation problems not seen, um, we it, it feeds that. You know what I mean? And then you're, if you make your whole life that, it's like, hey, your whole life shouldn't be recovery. It's a part of it. Right. Don't forget about your family. Don't forget about your, the people in front of you. And remember, this will never be enough. And I'm poster boy for Recover Out Loud. And now I kind of have a better understanding of like, ooh, I see how this could be a bad thing. Mm. Like how much are you recovering out loud? Because Recover Out Loud could be somebody who's just, oh, yeah, well, I spoke one time at an event. Just one time? Yeah. Okay. But when yeah, your but you're not a like, one-time kind of guy. No. Right. I have shirts that say I've been sexually abused, addicted, and suicide. I, I wear you. in public. It says you're not alone. I you love too. you. That's beautiful. Yeah. Keep doing that. Yeah. See, I think that God's placed this on you that like this is your gift. Hmm. What's wrong with that? And then I heard you say, sorry, this is coming to me, but you know, when you were molested by a man hmm. and, and, and there was a part of you that liked it, what's wrong with that? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you're whatever the label someone might call it. We're human. It's a feeling. If all that was taken away, the actual basis of that feeling or that instinct is like the connection and love. Mm-hmm. Maybe not the love we're looking top for, the ideal right. love we want, but in that moment, I don't know. I heard you take on a lot of responsibility that it was your fault for even having those thoughts. Mm-hmm. Do you, yeah. do you still live with that? No, no, I don't. I, I know it's not my fault no more. I mean, if the person's 50 something, I'm 14 and they took advantage of me for six months and I didn't want it, it's not my fault. So I'm able to recognize it. It was just back then I was confused because you watch movies and people are screaming when they're getting raped. Why am I not? Mm. You know, so it was really confusing, mm. especially when people share, oh my gosh. I'm like, oh my gosh, I should, <laughs> what's wrong with me? You know, but then you know, then you realize it's just it's a biological response to what is happening yeah. to you. And the guy had you on meth. It's like that's what it was. It had it was, it was nothing. It didn't make it. It doesn't mean that you want that to happen to you or that you think it's right for people to do that. Mm-hmm. There was a biological feeling connected to it. That's all that it was. Um, and so, but yeah, now I'm able to identify what's really going on. Instead of living with this fear of like, oh my gosh, everybody hates this when this happens to them. And I'm over here like, oh, it felt good. Right. Oh, it must be wrong with me. And then you look at research and research says if it happened to you, you do it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm losing my mind. But no, it's just a biological thing. I went polyamory in my yeah. sobriety because I was like, again, the, 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 yeah, my yeah. brain was like, okay, well, if your therapist told you you're not meant to be monogamous and, you know, I give therapy to people, I wouldn't tell someone they can't do that. So if they told you that, all right, let's try it. Right. <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. like, okay. And what, so what's wrong with that? And there's nothing wrong with it. Right. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's why I learned a lot. I have mm. so much respect for that community. Mm. You want to learn communication skills? Go to them. Yeah. Crazy. We'd be in a place, right? Me and the girl would be in a place having mm. a, a date. Me and my girlfriend at the time is my ex, mm-hmm. and you would have to desensitize yourself to it slowly. So first thing is okay. Usually, start off easy for the guy because he's the guy or whoever's more jealous. But um, you tell the girl, okay, um, she might ask, "What girl do you think is hot?" Oh, okay. Are you sure? That one. And then you know, okay, I'm like, how you feel? Nothing. I feel good. I can see she's hot. I kind of like that you like that. Okay. And then the guy has to go. All right, <laughs> what guy do you think is attractive in this room? And then they point, and then the guy looks nothing like you. And then you have to sit with that, right? Like, okay, why you? Got, what's happening? Are you getting insecure? Do you think I'm going to choose him over you because he doesn't look like you? Do you think that's the type of guy that I want because he doesn't look like you? Do you think I'm with you for other reasons? You got to work through that. But you learn that it's all fear-based. And if you feel insecure of fear of being alone, so you get to sit with that fear to work through it. And then once you learn how to get comfortable with those conversations, it's like freeing. Because then it's like, okay, well, if you find somebody else and that makes you happy, I'm happy for you. I love Mm. you. And if that person makes you happy, I don't want to hold you from your happiness. Mm. But that takes intense, intense exposure therapy. I was going to say, you can't do this with just another, with two people that are are not in um, the capacity to actually work through this because you're fucked. It's emotional. Oh, I it's heavy. You're looking at things that a human probably never gets a chance to look at. 
You know what I mean? Mm. You're never usually going to go there. And it's just such this radical honesty, mm. you know, to be like, just to have that freedom to do right. that mm. and feel peace with it and comfort. And tr that's radical trust. So I learned a lot from living that lifestyle because I was, I was never jealous, but I was insecure. So I'm not the person that's going to look at your phone. I'm not, I tell you, you can't hang out with guys. I've never been that guy. I hang out with people all the time. I don't want that. So, but it did come to, I still had a fear of not being good enough and not being attractive enough. So those things would cause me to, you know, react sometimes and um, settle for less. Think, well, if this girl likes me, she's hot. Like, I'm never going to get another girl like this. So let me just go in with this. Let me ignore some of those red flags because these parts are cool. I was codependent. I wasn't a loyal person my whole life. I was a codependent person. I didn't know I had opportunities, so it's easy to stay loyal to somebody. Mm. So that lifestyle made me finally become secure in myself, and it helped me understand what loyalty really is. It's a choice, not a need. And so it's freeing because now I'm like, hey, if you leave me, I don't care. If you want somebody else, I don't care. It has nothing to do with me, and I know that. And I know that if you don't want me, there's millions and millions of people out there that are choices at the end of the day. And I, it's, not, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. But that lifestyle taught me that. So I'm blessed that it gave me that. It was crazy. But, man, that's probably the only way I would have got it at that quickly pace. You know, I say that if my brother David – could hear this podcast the day or two or week before he OD'd that you would give him hope, Mr. Hope Dealer. Um, what does that look like? What does that sound like for someone who's out there and suffering and they just can't get it? Like, what does that mean? I mean, the first thing I would tell somebody if they're listening to is uh, listening to this and you're feeling hopeless, it's like reach out for help. Say what you're feeling. There's nothing wrong with you, what you're feeling or what you're thinking. But find somebody who you feel safe with and share everything with that person as much as you need to. It's not complaining, it's venting, it's processing. Mm -hmm. um, tell the person to do that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, everything you've been through has a purpose. Uh, you're stronger than you think. Mm -hmm. all, your, all the things that you hate are going to be things that you love. You're the main character in a movie. Everybody wants to be the main character. Nobody wants to be the background person running away from the building following. following. All the people you wish you were like, the normies, those are extras. You're Batman, you're Superman, you're Wonder Woman, you're the main character, but we all have to have struggles to be that character. So it's time to reach out for help, find community, you have to. There's so much more for your life, you know, but you just got to open up. That's, that's for yeah. you right there. And I think for men it's hard. Vulnerability is not sexy, you know, for men in I a sense, it right? Is, it yeah. is though, it is. Yeah, it's but it's it's so tough, Typical. you know. I work, I work more with women than men. And it's not because I want to. It's just men are just too prideful. They don't want to, I'm good. Okay, then I don't know what to do with you mm -hmm. if you're good. Mm -hmm. you know. But they just have such a hard time opening up. I think, I think men need more men who are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what they need. There's nothing like seeing a group of vulnerable men together talking and hugging and laughing and crying. Nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Something happens to me inside where and I, I, I see that and I'm like, ah, there's the magic. Like there's God in all of them. Yeah. And can they stay like that forever, please? <laughs> see, that's what I would say. The person listening. And find a program that works for you because there's so many programs out there. And I think that's the thing people try to say. This is the only way. There's so many ways. Mm. I just love AA and NA. I do too. Because it's everywhere yeah. and it's free and it's fun and it works. And to me, I believe there's more God in AA than anything. They meet you where you're at. Mm. They let you say what you want to say. Mm. Most places won't do that. Tell us more, please. Just tell us more. <laughs> what do you guys want to know about recovery I don't recovery know. Wise? I feel like a kid in a candy store that just wants to know more. So something, okay, so this is a big one I think okay. I like to talk on for people in recovery that people struggle with is forgiveness. Mm. What is forgiveness to you? And then I want to know what forgiveness is to you. Mm. Ah, that's a big one for me. Um, to realize that the person that I perceive to have hurt me has some form of sickness so how can I expect a sick person to treat me well? Mm. 
Did that answer That's the question? That's powerful. <laughs> That's powerful. You said literally, right, coming to this place, you're trying to come to this place to forgive someone, so how can I expect a sick person to not, like, like how can I expect a sick person to treat me well? They're sick. It's nothing personal. They're sick. Exactly. And I think that's that's a that's powerful, because sometimes we always say, "Well, they should they should have known." <laughs> I know a lot of things I should have known, and I don't do it. It's I, nothing I, personal. I used to say that. Yeah. I did. You know. They should know better. They should just know. I wouldn't do that, right? Until you become the alcoholic, and then you do what your parents did. You're like, "Oh my gosh, now I get it." Yep. Hurt people, hurt people. Mm-hmm. Mm. And heal people, heal people. Mm. What about you? What's forgiveness? Like acceptance and surrender kind of go hand in hand, but full acceptance of what is, surrendering to it, and then taking full responsibility because it's not about that other person. And if I can forgive the responsibility that I have in it, the whole situation is sort of, I, I just don't blame. You're finding your part, right? Very much so. Which is key because we always have a part in it. And it's so freeing, right? Because it's not for them, it's for us. Right. And think about what it says in the Bible. If you don't forgive others, I'm not going to forgive you. That's heavy. If you believe that, I believe it. So if you believe that, then, and God's not dumb. Because the art is, well, if you forgive them, it just blesses you. See, he's smart. It's not like it's some weird thing, like, or look at us. Like, no, when you forgive <laughs> others, it blesses you. <laughs> right. So God's still on our things. Like, he's trying to help us. That's just the language he uses. Um, and I always say the saying, which you don't forgive, you become. Mm. Mm. You're tired of being unhappy in your love life? You need to forgive. You're tired of becoming like your parents? You need to forgive. You're tired of dating people like your parents? You need to forgive. You're tired of reacting those ways when you get close to something? You need to forgive. Because it's that lack of forgiveness is why you become that thing. And it doesn't mean you're going to do exactly what they did, but the pain is going to bleed onto the people you love. You know, so... Yeah, you forgive so you can move on. Mm. And it doesn't justify what they did. And you're right. It's now here's now here's the here's the struggle though. Let's see how you guys look at this. What happens when you don't have the obvious part in it? Like when you're a kid. I think that's where people struggle with, right? Because it's obvious, like, okay, I was in a like you said, why well, I was in the bed, I went there, I was drunk, I was wasted, like I went there. You I know? was totally sober. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, <laughs> I struggle with that. So oh, can you give me shed some yeah. light on that? For so me? for so for example, okay, so being molested, right? If, if if my sponsor said, Well, what's your part? I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. I was a kid. What do you mean? Oh, I shouldn't have what I've been running around the playground, or I shouldn't have been running around that, right? That's uh, the first, right? That's where like a lot of people, which I get, and I was like that. I was like, there's no way, like this, no. But it was presented to me like, no, 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 I'm not saying that, but you do have a part. Um, he goes, has you holding on to this resentment hurt you anywhere? I go, I can't get close to men. I don't trust men. Um, when I'm around anybody that's in power, um, I, I'm not a fight, I'm a flight and a freeze, Ooh. right? And I hate that feeling. And then he goes, does it haunt you what happened to you? Is there a lot of fear? Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to be that person. I'm afraid that whatever it did to me damaged me forever. No one will ever love me. He goes, okay. And then he goes, what about intimacy? I go, it's twisted. I, I, I can't, I'm afraid. He goes, what if I told you if you find a way to forgive it, all that will go away. And so that opened up my eyes to like, you're telling me if I forgive it, this is going to go away? Okay, now I'm listening. But now help me understand what is my part. He says, your part's just holding on to it. Cool. That's it. Holding on to it's affecting you, and you admit it is how it's affecting you. So if you let it go, it won't affect you no more. And then he said, remember, you're not justifying what they did is right. You're not you're not letting that behavior be okay and you don't have to go up to them in person and say, hey, I forgive you. It's like, no, you do it in your meditation. You can write about it, talk with someone who's been through something similar. Um, and then the key component though is this, because just because you do it doesn't mean it's you're healed. What you're going to need to do for the rest of your life now is share that story 
so it stings less and share that story. So when a man comes up to you and says, me too, and you help him, now you know there's purpose to your pain. Mm. But you have to help because if not, your mind will say there is no purpose to this. And it gets easier and easier over time because now I'm grateful that it happened because I can speak to that pain. And I've helped out so many men and families. So that's the key component to how to forgive stuff like that. Is And it's, it's heavy, but you have to apply meaning to it. And that's what the steps don't have, right? So you have, um, you, sh you're, you share it, you're vulnerable, and then you got to accept it, right? Okay, I accept that it happened, and now you got to apply meaning to it to forgive it. Mm. You need meaning to it because meaning, you know, gives it purpose. And the meaning is that you're able to share your story with others and help others? Yeah. I was chosen by God to be a voice to help people heal from I'm a healer, but I can only heal you if I've suffered. And I love helping people. So the thing that I love to do, I can only do because I've been through pain. If I didn't go through that pain, I wouldn't be able to help people. I'm going to be that kid that's like, I'm a life coach. I'm 18 years old. I got my life coach certification. I'm like, what you been through? Oh, what do you mean? Is any suffering? Well, no. My parents paid for everything. We got a nice family and everything is great. And you're going to be my life coach? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard this saying, thank you for giving me this experience. That's heavy. That is heavy. I saw it on Oprah Winfrey. Oh, Oprah. <laughs> oh, Oprah. I love that. But I love that. Yeah. It's that is so powerful. Powerful. Conflicting. <laughs> it's heavy. And heavy. Yeah. It's forgiveness right there. Yeah. True forgiveness, mm -hmm. yeah. stuff, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes even what I said doesn't work for people. They're like, nope. Right. And then, but you see them suffer. Right. Because either they don't, they can't get sober because of it, or they're just angry in their recovery. Or you see their life, how it looks. It's because they're holding on to that thing. It's like, it's, hey, be it's free. hard it because, hmm. I, you know, hmm. I don't want that experience. Mm -hmm. The fuck? For giving me that experience? Yeah. You know, and that's but what, you have to do something yeah. good with it. You have to. And didn't you say something earlier, like God? Um, if you're strong enough, God gives the strongest battles to strongest warriors. That's yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Say it again, please. God gives his strongest battles to his strongest warriors. It has to be true has for people to be like true. us. It's what keeps us alive. I mean, think about it. If everything we went through had no purpose, why are we even trying? Life is terrible then. Life is ugly. And I'm so angry that I had to experience life like this. Why can't I be like those people that didn't? Right? That's the mindset we'll fall into. But when you can look at it through God's lens, people wish they had our lives. Mm -hmm. The people we want to be like because they have normal lives, they want to be us. Because they see how fulfilled we are, how much fun we're having, how much depth we have. And... Everybody wants to be around mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. but we can't, and we can't teach you that. Mm -mm. You can't go to school for it. Mm -mm. <laughs> you need to go through some pain and trauma. <laughs> you want some trauma? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Date that person. <laughs> Fall in love with them. Come back to me in two years. You'll have some wisdom. <laughs> right? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And God made me this way to reach those people, and I don't want to be anybody else. Oh my so God. I giving up everything. And then me and my girl were moving to Bali, and then we have five months. We're going to be there because we're keeping our property here in LA, and then we're going to come back. And so I'm excited because I'm doing this new podcast for me. I finally get to interview the people I want to. I get to do my social media I want. To. I get to do a YouTube channel, and I get a vlog. Hey, guess what, guys? I gave up everything. Let's see how this this world looks like. And God is amazing because I found out a f one of my social media followers is like, and he like loves me to death. He goes, "I live in Bali." I'm like, "No way!" I got a sober friend. I hit up my other friend from Australia that I've never met but got interviewed by. Hey, I, maybe I could visit you. She's like, I'm coming to Bali for a month. The AA convention's in June. Do you want to speak there? It's like, no way. We're you, coming we're to going. Bali. Oh, you guys are going to Bali. We're well, coming now to we Bali. are. Now, now we are? are? Okay, perfect. See, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Look at God's making it so easy. Yes. My other friend was like, oh, my sister lives there. She wants to get sober. Her husband's there, and he's a multimillionaire on Bali. I'll introduce you to him. I'm like, more people? And then the treatment center out there I got in contact with, they're going to send me a private driver to drive me to their treatment center to speak and donate my time to keep <sighs> me in service. And, and it's wild because I hit up the gym. 
out there. We connected on Instagram. I'm going to go to that gym all the time and do jump rope videos for them. And everything is just so easy. My God, you're in this. And everything to cancel, to move things around was too easy. Everyone was so supportive and everything I called was like, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You need that. You need that. Cool. I'm like, and then I started getting new contracts to make money while I'm gone. I'm like, this God, you are in this journey. Yeah, you are. I need this because it, how it was working, it just wasn't working for me no more. I don't, I don't need validation like that no more. I'm secure in myself now. And I don't want to do these other things that people say, this is the way in recovery you right. can do that. I'm like, I, I don't care. I don't like that. Right. I don't care about money. I don't care about starting a treatment center. I don't care about admissions or sales or this yeah. or that. And I'm so tired of having these great ideas to help people. And then people steal my information or they waste my time or they don't listen. You know, so I'm like, you know, I'm going to do it for me. Oh <laughs> you know, start helping people. And so. This and is so, incredible. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. So that's. You, you are incredible. You really you. are incredible. But I don't think you're giving up anything. I feel like you're just Gaining making everything. exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're making the moves to truly yeah. step into to, to who who you truly are. I hope you were listening to that message right there. Not you. Them. Oh, the listeners. They. Don't let your brand become your prison because you may choose your reputation over your livelihood. Because I tried committing suicide Christmas to New Year's that just passed. That's why. I tried shooting myself. I tried drowning myself and jumping off a balcony uh, what, less than a month ago. That's what was going on behind the scenes. And so my girlfriend was like, if money wasn't a problem, what would you do? Because I take care of my sick mom. So I, I'm always stuck to something to pay. And I've never been good with budgeting money because I give it all away. I take people out seven days a week. <laughs> like, But you know what I mean? That's just how I live my life. And so I was in this place and my girlfriend was like, well, how about this if I was to help? She's like, I know you're not going to take advantage of me or this and that. Like, you mean good. And, I, and I'm like, you serious? Because she travels the world. So she's like, she's like, I'm built for this. Like, let's go. And so because of her, I found hope, which is how I didn't take my life. And then God showed up. And I'm like, here's some money now. So she doesn't help you as much as you need to. Here's some more money residually. Here's some more money. Look at these people. Like, look at this. Now it's actually going to work. Everything's going to work. So I can pay my mom's bills while I'm gone. I can pay what I need to. And then I was able to give up things that I don't need anymore. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's I'm excited, and uh, there's nothing I'm looking for because five months is enough time that something's gonna happen. <laughs> like I'm, I don't have to worry. It's not like a two week vacation. Where I'm like, this is my intention. Like, no, I'm gone. You don't know. Yeah. If it's five, six, seven, yeah. ten a year, you you don't. Yeah. Or the rest of your life. It's true. I mean, I know for sure I will be coming back because we have our property. Because my girlfriend has a nonprofit called Travel Through Trauma helping women travel solo to heal <gasps> and they have counseling and also I'm helping her I build love that. Your girlfriend. Oh, she's amazing. <gasps> she's your angel. Oh, she's amazing. She's she's the person I'm like, yeah, I'll push you in front of the scary place before I go there. She's that person. Oh She'll be like, God. bring it. <gasps> you know what I mean? I love it. I need that. Cause I'm 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 the ball of energy. She's the grounded one. She's like, mm. you know, and it's yeah, she's amazing. So interesting because it's like that double edged sword. Like you're giving certain parts up because you don't want the attention but yet what you're going into is still it's very interesting mm -hmm. like i I, th I think that what i'm trying i think what i want to do is okay Fausto, you love helping people but now I'd learn how to navigate it better mm -hmm. look how when you're gone nothing Jane. fell apart because you were gone exactly. you, you were gone and look you lived isn't that interesting we think we leave we take a vacation yeah. we do something and everything stops and yeah. changes Nothing happens. Nothing. It's as if you were never even here to begin with. Yeah. It's incredible. We were talking about this earlier, saying yes to the universe, but also saying no and mm. having that time to, you know, take care of yourself, that inner yeah. care. We're, that's because I was even, I was, I was crying in the car because I was like, damn, God, I'm going to lean on you a lot, huh? And that was exciting though, because I am, because I'm like, I'm away from everything. So, all right, God, you're with me. Let's, I'm going to need you, you know, and I feel God say, I got you. You're finally listening to me, you know, and, and, it's, and it's beautiful because the only reason why I'm alive today is because I believe God is real and I thought God was fake the past two years because nothing was working and it was scary. And now I'm back to God's like, I'm right here. I had to use that to get you here. You know what you want. You know who you are. Don't let anybody else dictate that. I got you. You don't need anybody 
to get where you want to get because I will get you there and I'll put the right people because all the people you're around weren't the right people. They're good people, but they weren't the people that for the next phase of your life. And so it's beautiful to have that, you know, because I sometimes think I'm delusional in how I see God and that's scary sometimes for me. What do I know? And God's like, I think you know me more than most people do. Amen. It's in the absence of your father, you seek the father more. So don't get mad that your dad's not in your life. It's a blessing because that distance makes you seek me more. Someone who has a dad, they don't need me that much. So, yeah. Mm. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. You give yeah. me hope. Oh, you guys too. This is, this is really exciting. Mm. I love you so guys. Good. You guys are so cool. So yeah. good. We'll see you in Bali. Yes. Yay! Bali. Bali. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope these stories have touched your hearts and left you with a newfound appreciation for the incredible strength within us all. And if you found our podcast to be a source of inspiration, we'd be extremely grateful if you could take a moment to rate and review us. Yes, review us, review us. Your support helps us reach more people on the path to recovery. And while you're at it, hit that follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Remember, you're not alone. One day at a time, we got this.